Hello, my name is Ruben Silva, and this is the story about a great man and a great artist that I have the honor to get to know and work with. In 2003, I met Ralph for the first time and since then, I've heard many stories that he has lived through. In 2006, I had the opportunity to work with him in several art projects where I experienced at first hand the methods and routines that Raf uses on a daily basis. Recently, Raf expressed his interest in leaving something behind as a legacy for local artists and for his family. My hope is that this documentary will give you a glimpse of what it is like to be around Ralph and also to show you the pieces of art that he produced for the University of Arkansas Fort Smith where I am a student. My classmates Corey Woodard, Brad Carney and I spent a few days shadowing Ralph and asking him questions about his life and about the pieces of art that he produced at the university. Raph was born May 24, 1942, in Long Beach, California. He has lived in Arkansas since 1982 with his wife Nancy and two children. He has survived his son, Ralph Benton. Ralph has also served in the United States Army as a medic in the Vietnam War. My classmates and I had the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with Ralph at his art gallery and studio. And this is what Ralph told us about his life and artwork. So I come from a family of, of uh, craftsmen. Uh, they're all masons. From that, when we moved here in Arkansas, I was able to take my studies, which were, and I had a degree in art history, and I was able to parlay that into the trade that I have today. So I do, I'm a multimedia artist. I work with about 40 different mediums, wood, stone, glass, fiber, and design also paint and sculpt, you know, all those different things. You know, really feel blessed to be able to work at something that you really felt like you were created to do, you know, as a person. And uh, it's been a great teacher and I think, uh, you know, our communities, you know, like a community artist, you know, I feel like I've done something for them and given them things that 
otherwise they were never going to have. Uh, in a way, you know, as an artist, I see myself as a communicator. It's, it's a way of telling stories. I'm a storyteller. And through the years, uh, I've been, I should say, blessed with, with ideas. And one of those, you know, if you want to think of them as an invention, was to come up with the idea of using redwood as a means for telling stories through making murals. So uh, we developed these large murals that take about a dozen steps per inch, you know, where we use, you know, California clear hardwood, redwood, and then we cut it uh, using a, a sand carving process, and then we overlay it with river sand and then hand paint it. So those are something that have really been significant because I still think they're the only ones being created anywhere, uh, maybe in the world, that, that we uh, work on those. Uh, I've come up with ideas and concepts using materials that are kind of uh, people don't take seriously, you know, like uh, developing enamel paint on paper, works on paper, and uh, using something as simple as spray cans, and people just wouldn't never guess that that's how that material has been used, but yet it still creates a really interesting, and it kind of ties back to my masonry background because many times uh, the surfaces look like stone, that type of thing. And then in, uh, in more recently, I've been uh, creating furniture from, by repurposing a material that is most commonly thrown into a dumpster. It's used in the printing industry and they print on cardboard boxes, putting the graphics on the outside of these, uh, uh, these wooden cylinders. They're made in 180 degree, they're halves, and then they put them together. So anyway, I have found a, a supply of those, and so I've designed close to 100 pieces of furniture just from those, repurposing this material, and I've been able to come up with the architectural details, um, actually building systems, and not to mention furniture and other you know, useful things. You know, that, and it's actually I've created a whole um, style. I call it Neo Deco because it kind of reminds me of the old Art Deco from the from the uh, 30s, but yet it's been uh, has a very contemporary look. And uh, so anyway, that's been interesting to me. Uh, you know, besides, uh, I, I never saw myself as a teacher, but it looks like uh, in my latter years that I may be doing more teaching and sharing with your generation. put this reflector wall to make sure the air goes around inside the kiva and then they put their hearth on the other side yeah. and that way they protect it. And then I have dreams and hopes of developing uh, an art school in Belize uh, for their populations and uh, young people and using their materials to not only create a style but also to teach them how to craft things that they actually can export, you know, and, and use for making a living. So tell me, what was the process like to make these mirrors? Well, uh, of course we were asked to create something for this area. We always call it the ballroom. And it was my thought that, you know, it should represent the many cultures that, you know, that we would study and, and people who actually attend the university. So it's really multicultural in every way. So we did the research and, and selected the images we wanted to use, many times representative of cultures gone, you know, so it's, it's as much a historical record as anything else. And so um, there's 28 of them, and so each one was researched and we would create not only the central image, but we would also uh, have a decorative border that would be, you could identify with that particular culture. Uh, what we used was uh, like a, a specialized stencil material to put on the, the back of the mirror and you know, we do everything in reverse because it is a mirror and so then we'd lay out the drawings and then I would do a lot of the hand cutting and then my assistant Matt Mears uh, would be working on borders and then we had one other person who worked on the outside edges and so we're just like a little factory there we were just working and, and uh, you know every couple of days or so we would have another mirror ready and, and all the designs are actually cut in using high-pressure sand and that's uh, and that's how 
uh, we can cut in and get the, the really fine detail. I had uh, gone to Italy to uh, on a special uh, art uh, trip, and uh, you're around so much spectacular sculpture and, and uh, you know incredible buildings. You know, just everything's out of marble. So I came back and still was thinking about all of that when this commission came in, and so I come up with the idea to do this big sundial and to use some of the same methods that I saw, you know, in Italy. Um, you know, the idea of using, you know, lots of, like, the, this is a native marble and the, and the scale of it. And, and being here at a, at a university, I felt like one of the valuable things that we all have to think about is our use of time. And so cut into the surfaces of these stones, which, uh, uh, like I say, is a native marble, are various verses and sayings by people throughout history with reference to time, the value of it, and what we do with our time. You know, we're only allotted a certain amount and, uh, and you know, in a sense we're responsible to make sure that the time that we do have is used wisely uh, in every, you know, part of our life. So, uh, you know, this thing is, is inlaid with uh, different types of granite, colored granites. It's the only thing on the whole campus is true north. Uh, we took a sunshot using an engineering uh, group to make sure that we had absolutely true north because that's necessary for a sundial to work properly. And so uh, it's been a, you know, a nice addition. And it's also a time capsule and it was commissioned by the, uh, this McSpad. And um, so anyway, we, uh, or the McSpad Ray family. And anyway, it was a great opportunity to do something like this that's substantial and um, you know, has a historical aspect about it too. Tell me how you came up with the name for Spirit. Well, I was thinking about, um, of course, where it's being located, but I was thinking about the human being and how we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. And I thought it'd be just really neat to kind of come in from that approach, the idea of this kind of ethereal lifting piece you know, soaring because when people have health issues and things like that, um, the thing that really pulls them through is their willness, uh, or, you know, to, the will to live. And uh, so it becomes actually kind of a spiritual uh, uh, odyssey, you know, for many people. Uh, the materials are made out of acrylic, and the form I chose was representative. We used to have a mine in California where we mined turbulence. So I was very acquainted with that crystal form, so I thought I would use that as the vehicle uh, to carry the idea. And so it's a six-sided crystal, but it's everything's made out of acrylic, and then it's all hand polished and, and you know hand beveled. Just to, and it's very heavy. But I made a small model and brought it here to show the, uh, Chancellor Stubblefield, and he could see how it was going to work and everything. So. So the decisions were made right here, where we're standing, uh, to do this particular project. But it was uh, amazing when it all went together. You know, I almost lost two men in the process. My nephew and another guy, you know, <laughs> reaching out that far because it's very, very heavy. You know, and and I was on the floor lifting up units, and they were pulling, and so, but it uh, came together finally, and I think it's spectacular.